Welcome back, everybody. We'll begin by reading together in Psalm 130. Psalm 130, we're just about to look at a sermon organization on this one. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning." Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. May God bless that reading to us. Simon, would you open in prayer for us? Any questions from yesterday on reflection? Okay, let's move on then. Psalm 130, we'll take up now. Arms. Would this just be this passage has that to be okay? example, when a person's using misery to live in gratitude, obviously they're connected with other catechumens. Perhaps they're doing this in conjunction with question two of Lord's Day One, which is, what are the three things necessary for you to know the Christian life? And it's basically misery to live in gratitude. And if that's the case, um, this is a very good, I've actually done this myself, preach this text, preach this psalm through that particular lens. And then I call it something like um, the experiential life, or, or David's summary of the experiential life. Um, and then the experience of sin and misery, the experience of deliverance in Christ, and the experience of uh, uh, sanctifying gratitude, or something like that. And then the verses 5 and 6, the waiting on the Lord comes under the part of gratitude, of <coughs> living a life of obedience and submission and so on. So it, it can be done, but the problem with just using misery to live as gratitude is, I mean, misery, what does that mean, an aspect of Christian life, misery, if you don't explain it. So the, the points are too short mm -hmm. at, at that point. But with the right title and the right framework, I think you, 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 could, you could use it. Uh, the other problem I would have, however, would be that this is a huge amount to preach, <coughs> to preach through that. 
that entire song. Um, I like, actually, I've, I've done several times, I've preached verses one and two as a whole sermon by itself, and then verses three and four as another sermon, and then verses five through eight as a third sermon. And there's plenty of preaching material here for three sermons, really. But again, if you just want to do the basic experience of a Christian, um, I think it is workable. Okay. It, it needs, it needs a fine tune. I wondered if we could sort of add to these and make it, keep that structure, but make it more text specific, like something like, you know, misery in the pit, uh, deliverance from the pit, gratitude outside of the pit, or something like that, just to, um, yeah. Okay, Sam, any comments on that before we go? Psalm 147, verses 1 to 5. Give you a minute or two to just look at that in the Word and have a think about it. 147, 1 to 5. I think what's interesting here is we have three points that are nice and parallel. He gathers the outcasts, he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds. And these points are taken into the proposition, the great physician stooping down to gather the outcasts, heal the brokenhearted, and bind up their wounds. And I think that could very easily be made into a, a shorter theme, title, so what about these as the actual points of the psalm? And he's saying here, remember, it, although he's taking 1 to 5, his focus is verses 2 to 3. Any thoughts? I think that's a great point, and it really highlights a common error that we all at times fall into dealing with Hebrew poetry. As you know, Hebrew poetry has so much parallelism in it, and it's often very tempting to see two statements that look different, like, he heals the broken heart, he binds up their wounds, and say these are two points, but they're actually just two ways of saying the same thing. So it's, again, something to really watch out for or you end up with a false division. The one thing I thought was a wee bit missing, what, what makes this most amazing to me, it's not so much you know, the, the gathering, the healing, the binding, it's who that's doing this, which is really brought to the fore in verses 4 and 5. So I think one, verses 2 and 3 are amazing, but what makes them super amazing is verses 4 and 5, that it's the God who counts the number of the stars and calls them all by name, who is of great power, his understanding's infinite, it's this, the massiveness of God, and yet dealing in, with such individual people in such an intimate and minute way. So... I think just always, you know, when you get your text, you think, oh, I'm going to focus on two verses. Just, you know, take the wider view in case you really miss a massive point that would more deeply impress this truth. Now, it, it's, it might be there, you know, it might be a, it might be a good way to, to end a sermon. Um, personally, I think I would want that right up front. So that as you look at each point, the gathering and the healing and the binding, it's astounding as you go rather than you come with a big punch at the end. <coughs>
how God builds Jerusalem. And then say he's a gatherer, he's a healer, and he gathers the outcasts, he, he heals the wounded, and then say he he um, he counts the stars. Hmm. And that would give you a okay. freedom under point three to really focus on bring two A and verses four and five together. Okay. Like, this is God doing all this. Right. Yep. Some way of bringing that in, I think, would be important here. Any other comments? Right, let's do Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, slightly smaller text. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. <clears throat> Thoughts? Paul? Okay, good. So, the first one would be turn around or redirection. The second one would be turn wholeheartedly or dedication. Okay, let, let's just pause so we get these right. What was the first one again? Turn around? Okay. Yep. What was that last word you said? Repetition. Repetition. Okay. Oh, this is the word I can never spell. Um, repetition. Does that look right? Oh, well, that's the first time in my life. Imagine doing that in front of the president, eh? That's the Lord's deliverance. <laughs> what was the last one? Okay, so So do you think Paul's improved the organization of this, the outline? Turn around, turn wholeheartedly, turn constantly, turn for holiness. Are they all separate points? Turn around, turn wholeheartedly, turn constantly, turn for holiness. They look all separate, don't they? not in your own understanding, that's your turn around, um, turn wholeheartedly is with all thy heart, turn constantly, is that the tenses of the verb? Uh, that's in, all your ways, all your in all your ways, okay, um, turn constantly in all your ways, yep. And then turn for holiness. That's, this, is an this is an interesting text because <clears throat> what Paul's trying to do here is very commendable. He's trying to put everything in a pattern. But um, there's a problem, Paul, and that is that you are trying to put everything into the, the grid of turning the, the important concluding words. Verse 6 is really about what God is doing. Not about, not about us turning for holiness or sanctification. It's about God directing our paths. 
And that's a problem you struggle with a lot. Like if you pay fair points because you can't force that poor point into that into that mode. And so you need to have um, you need to have a, a, another point system here. Maybe it just needs to be a two point sermon. Like you know, what does it mean to trust in the Lord? And then secondly, the fruit of trust in the Lord, God will direct our paths, but don't see how you can put it all on the theme of turning when the promise and the answer and the response comes from God here. The, 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 I think the first, the bit before the slash, with the bit without the slash, after the slash, with the way it just went, redirection, dedication, repetition, sanctification. Does that work or is that still... What if you took that last point you made there, if that's really the sum and substance of it, God will direct your paths. You could make that your sort of your main thought. God directs the paths of, number one, those who trust in the Lord with all their heart. Number two, those who do not lean on their own understanding. Number three, those who acknowledge him in all his ways. Something like that. The only problem is verse 5 might be parallelism. I don't think it's exactly. I think it is looking at things from two points of view. I think when you do make it all about turning, and, and yet turning isn't so obvious, you know, that's when you maybe end up just squeezing things a little bit. Good discussion. Thank you. How about, oh, here's another one on the same passage. So again, we have a question outline, you notice. I don't think we need to say on that, but here's a wonderful text, Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint, run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The need, the secret, and the consequence of renewed strength. So, are these in the text, the need for renewed strength? Well, obviously it's implied they shall renew their strength. Be weary. Fainting. by the secret of waiting on the Lord, which produces renewed strength, or uh, weakness and tiredness is met by, is, is healed by, is replaced by waiting on the Lord, which produces running, walking, soaring, something like that. Initially, as um, you know, like a one page statement of why we need it as an introduction to point two. <clears throat> why not just have the title be How Do We Renew Our Strength? I think that would be really interesting to people. Hmm. And then just say, you know, its secret and its consequence. Simple, short. Don't always have to have three points. No. 
<laughs> Although it helps when you're preaching in heritage. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily. You can have a, in this case, your first point would be 30 minutes anyway. <laughs> Okay, we move on. Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. So again, you see what I was saying yesterday, there just seems to have been an awful lot of outlines with just the questions. Servant shall or something enter so what how it say up it's And then all these verbs follow, don't they? It's almost crying out for this treatment. It's just a very, you know, this servant. Well, let's just try it. Let, let's, let's try and do this one together. I think that you could do the verbs, you could do adjectives here as well. So let's just make our main point here, our main noun. Servant. So you're either going to put adjective in front of the servant or a verb or after servant, the servant who, da da da, something like that. So let's just, let's just work our way through this. The first thing we're told is, is that he is an upheld servant whom I uphold. So let's just put that down there. I'm not saying these will be our ultimate He's an upheld servant, my elect, so he's an elect servant, in whom my soul delighteth, so he is a, you know, a pleasing servant, um, I think we need to work on that word, delightful, just delightful, yeah, um, spirit-filled servant. Anointed, okay. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. That, that sounds like a negative when we think of judgment, but it wasn't. In Old Testament times, it was someone who was bringing justice to the oppressed, usually. So I think you could put there a, um, maybe a, a saving servant or a delivering servant, because that's what the, these Judges often were, th they were thought of having cry nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. That's all really saying the one thing, isn't it? But what what adjective could we use to silent? silent? Quiet, meek, something like that, or humble. Yeah. A bruised reed he shall not break. Smoking flax he won't quench. That negative.
Okay. In that verse, and that would bring you down to to, to less less points. For example, the last verse about the bruised reed, and then going on in verse four, shall not be able to be discouraged, and so on. Or actually, no, all of verse three, I think, could be summarized under the word compassion. Okay. Right. Sermon. Yeah, I, th I think Doctor Beak is making a great point there. When you do end up with seven or eight points, that might be okay, but you do want to begin to think: Is there a way of collapsing some of these together? You know, are there some similar enough that we could make it less? Because I think, in general terms, you, obviously it's much easier to remember three or four points than seven or eight. Brian. First three, okay. Well, I'm sorry, second, elect. Underneath okay, yep. Two, delightful and anointed because they go together. Um, those two are sub points underneath elect. Okay. Good. So you see the kind of approach. We're not saying this is conclusive, but in a few minutes we are, we're beginning to move towards a, a better outline here. This is a special title reserved for Christ. So I think that word elect is a very important word there. And then you can incorporate all those thoughts under, under, under point one. But that's a whole 15 minutes preaching in itself, what the whole concept of servant is, right? They need some space for that. Yeah. One thing I wondered about was how God views him, how we experience him. Because you've got at the beginning there God's descriptions of him and then it moves more towards how that is applied, how he works in our lives. That might be another way of just grouping them together a bit more. Yeah. And the other thing to really watch here is to just assume that, I think that was one of Dr. Beaky's points there, we've heard sermons here in the seminary when Ray Lanning used to teach in the class and his one of his favourite moves was you know, at the end of the sermon to pick the, the most obvious word and say, well, what does that mean? You never told us what servant meant. So your ten temptation here is to really focus on the adjectives and, and you just totally miss the, the servant, especially the, the fact that servant in the Bible, as Dr. Beek said, is so unique. so much on each tree hmm. that the sense of the forest can be lost. And so you need to ask yourself, is there something in the text that you can keep coming back to hmm. that connects all of this? And here you've got a wonderful example because the first three words, behold my servant. So you can say, behold he's the elect one. Then you get the next word, behold my servant. He's pleased and delightful. Behold my servant. He's meek and humble. You just keep Repeating that, behold my servant, it just seems to tie it all together. Hmm. And then, if you can look at your application at the end and say, now, here's the application to the people of God. You need to behold the servant. Are you beholding the servant? Here's the application. Every unconverted person needs to behold the servant. So, that phrase, by the time people walk out, hmm. they feel like this What a rich servant of God. I need to behold him. Hmm. So, you've got to. A string that runs through the whole sermon. Correct. Then I'll just and then we're a little bit to to say what I believe. But you've so I, I like Quite 
So all these are actions were uh, behind. So the, the Buddhist, the Buddhist managed to say that the being of Christ cannot be treated like parallel, like what God will do to him and what Jesus will do is, is to be treated separate, differently. Being with Christ may be more important than mm -hmm. all these actions so we focus on right. the being of Christ. Right. I think you make a good point, Simon, in terms of importance and logical priority, yes. You know, all that God has done to him, for him, with him, all that God describes him as is, is far more important. And I suppose that would be one of the advantages of, of dividing this up into how God views him and secondly, how we experience him, rather than making you know, these three or four points under how God views them, the same as, in terms of the collection of points, the application. So, I, I think there's, there's merit in what you've said. Yeah. Let's move on. Isaiah 57, 15, another marvelous text. Thus says the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, and so on. So what do we have here again? We have got questions. <laughs> it's, it's kind of not questions in a way. It's, it's who God is, where God dwells, with whom God dwells why God dwells, but you can see, see that the idea is still there. So I think the sermon proposition is great here. It sums up the text really well. Though God be high and holy, yet he condescends to dwell with those of a contrite and a humble spirit. But let's see if we can just get something together here that it might be these points, but presents them in a better way. <coughs> What's the key idea here? What is the main verb in this text? Other dwelling, isn't it? A place. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, okay? His dwelling place is eternity. It's also described further as, I dwell in the high and the holy place. So here we've got descriptions of a home, don't we? It's eternal, it's high, it's holy. But then, with him also... So there's, he's dwelling here in eternity in a high and a holy place and also, so the very structure of the text would suggest there are two emphases here, two dwelling places. And what is this second dwelling place? It's a human spirit, isn't it? And a particular kind of human spirit, a contrite one, a humble one. And what, why does he come there? What does he do there as he lives there? He revives the heart of the contrite ones, doesn't he? 
So what do you have here? You've got God's two homes, don't you? The high and the holy place and the humble and contrite spirit. High and holy heaven and a humble human spirit. It's just incredible, isn't it? I have a perfect introduction for this sermon. May I share it with you? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Dear congregation, there was once a little boy who answered an atheist when he was speaking at a, at a conference. And the atheist was trying to prove that there was no God. And at the end of his talk, a little boy came forward. And the little boy said to the atheist, you are wrong. There is a God. And the atheist said, well, prove it to me. Well, the boy said, I can prove it to you in two ways. God is so big that the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. And yet he's so real, he can live in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. So today, congregation, we want to see this high and holy and lifted up God dwelling in a contrite sinner's heart. Yeah. Our text is... It's phenomenal. <laughs> it's phenomenal, isn't it? Really. You get, this, you get the attention of the children right there. Yeah, right yeah. It's an awesome text. I mean, you really want to, that first point about the highness, the holiness, the eternity, you just want to lift that as high as you possibly can, make it as big as you possibly can, because then the power of the second point is multiplied, isn't it? Insofar as you make that first point, that second point is going to come with such power. So this outline is not terrible here because you're getting everything in the text. The problem yeah. is it's just a little bit too analytical because it divides down into four sections. And what Dr. Murray said a moment ago is really what you have in the text is this contrast between the highness and, and the lowness. So you immediately see there, when you see that, this is a two-point sermon. You want, you want the highness and you want the God dwelling in, in the humble sinner. You want those as your two points. And you can then has sub points, three or four sub points under each point, but the structure of the text is a two point sermon, not a four point sermon. Simon? So these texts so uniquely about Christianity. Yeah, don't they? Islamic that. <laughs> right. Very different. Yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. Ryan? Just two points that come to my mind more. The height of God's dwelling and the home of God's home. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the amazing thing, brothers, is that God is in every single Christian heart here. This is true of you and of me. You know, this is a sermon you want to just apply to your own soul in a mighty way before you preach it. Every sermon is, but this is special. You should be in awe and wonder as you, as you preach this from start to finish. Okay, let's just start with this one. I, I, we didn't do this one. Luke 2, 8 to 12. I don't think we did. did. 2, 8 to 12. It's all a very well-known text. The announcement of Christ's birth to the shepherds. We have a proposition. The message of Christ's birth is a message of good tidings to all people which ought to elicit from us faith and great joy. So, does it bring into the proposition all the points here? 
It certainly has the appropriate response, faith and great joy, the glorious subject, uh, the message of Christ's birth. Maybe that could be developed a little bit more there. It's a message of good tidings, circumstance of the message. That isn't really brought in there. So that, again, that proposition might be expanded a little just to bring in the, the circumstances of the message. In terms of a title, announcement of good news, just it, it doesn't need to be anything more wonderful than that. But what about the actual points? The circumstances, the nature, the subject, the response. <clears throat> Dr. Beaky, I'm sure you've preached on this a few times. <clears throat> to Luke 2 sermons, it, all those, all the whole chapter of Luke 2 is so graphic in terms of pictures, so familiar to people, the, the outline should have a historical flow to it, so that people, people want to hear the story retold. And the problem with this outline is it's, it's, it's too, um, it's too, I don't know what it's called, it's too distant, it's too... Hmm. There's an attempt here made, you know, the glorious subject. So the, the, there's an attempt there. There isn't here, it's just the nature, the circumstance. And it actually isn't parallel, therefore. Yeah. I think the points need to be the action things that happen to the shepherds. The first recipients of the, of, of the gospel, of, 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 of the incarnation, of, of Christ's birth, first recipients, you know. It's the shepherds. Um, and then you, you'd have to go through that. the angel of the Lord shining the shepherds, the angel of the Lord bringing the good shepherds. Stay back. Mm. I think that you can sort of end with this uh, question that we that gets answered of where do I find this Christ? Christ in verse twelve there's this will be a sign to you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. But I think that there's a point that reflects, okay, this is a, a message, this is the announcement, this is the city of David, this is right. the Messiah <clears throat> coming, his arriving, here's the proclamation. Where do I find this Christ? Where do right. I find him? Where do I see him? And it and ends in there. So I think you can really end the sermon on this high note. Of, yeah. Good. Yep. Good. Excellent, Josh. Good. And piggybacking on that, the lowliness of the of the of the child wrapped in swaddling clothes, swaddling clothes referring to legitimacy yet poverty, because they're rags tied together. Um, the lowly, the lowly savior. And of course, the shepherds, as, as you probably all know, were the, were one of the most despised occupations. So it's a, there's a theme running through here that this is amazing. God's giving his first gospel proclamation of the born Emmanuel as a lowly savior to lowly people. So people should walk away from this sermon saying, Gospel's not too high for me. My, my problem, if I don't know it, is it's probably too low for me and I don't want to stoop to receive it. Mm -hmm. 
Simon. I also feel the atmosphere of this passage is that such an amazing, glorious announcement. Hmm. The way to announce it is very glorious. Right. But the message itself is also with this great news. So it's all joy of announcing right. the message itself. Right. This kind of thing should be incorporated into this. Good, culture. good. How amazing we can see this great news and can ask congregations, do you feel this kind of joy? Yeah, good. Yeah, you've maybe got there for a contrast. You've got a lofty announcement and you've got a lowly audience. You know, something like that might gather it together. If your focus is going to be on the glory and, and the absolute wonder of the rockness of God, then you've also got to bring in verses 13 and 14. Because that's where the angels then break through in the multitude and say, Glory to God in the highest. <coughs> Uh, just as an aside on this point, obviously depending on your the tradition you end up in, you, you're going to have to preach, you know, this kind of sermon quite often, um, you know, especially in the Dutch Reformed tradition. And uh, one thing I was doing when I first came here was I was thinking, well, I mean, they've heard so many sermons in Luke to, you know, so I'll do something from Hebrews or, you know, First Timothy, Great the Mystery of Godliness, and Doctor Vicky said, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter if they've heard it, you know, a hundred times, they want to hear Luke 2 again. <laughs> so, not, not, not a day for being smart and original, probably. But the beauty of Luke 2 is there's so much in the first 20 verses. We can do it in so many different combinations, in so many different ways. It's very preachable and clear. Yeah. And learning. Right. We just miss the whole person, and right. it's too bad. Yeah. We right. just do not know this person, but know all the organs here. Yeah. Good, good illustration, Simon. Very good illustration. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Martha and Mary, one sitting, one serving. So we have a title here, The Danger of Service Over Sitting. And then the two points are service over sitting, which is Martha, sitting over service, which equals Mary. A lot of it is Martha's problem of judging Mary and her inability to sit still when she really needs to sit still. Does somebody want to suggest an outline then, based on these comments? Okay. Or, I mean, trying to get more, right? So we're supposed to sit in order to serve, right? Right. Rather not in opposition to each other, but they flow together and interweave. Hmm. 
I like that, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Or you could simply call the sermon the one thing needful. Hmm. Really focus on the need to 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 that you need to learn to sit and receive the gospel and learn to believe in Jesus Christ, a daily life of communion. And then say that doesn't mean you don't go out and serve, but Martha's problem is she's judging Mary and so on, but picking up on 42A, the one thing is needful, I think is, 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 is a good way of approaching it. Also, hermeneutically, because at the end of Jesus' stories, parables, <coughs> miracles, he often gives us the, the meaning in the last verse. Mm. So if you capitalize on that, you have a natural scriptural title, the one thing is needful, that immediately directs you to your Yep. I think Ryan's point is good as well. And you can see that just one little tweak, you know, it takes um, us into, you know, from a poor questionable outline to almost, you know, perfect. So it just sometimes needs that little extra push of work, of thought, of prayer that could really make or break a sermon. I always feel, I get to these points always in sermons where I'm just, I've done enough. You know, I could get by with it. But that next hour or two is, is where the real grind comes and yet often where the real fruit comes. And it's just, just when you feel satisfied, always tell yourself you're not there yet. You've got more work to do. And, and it's usually as, as that deeper work is done that the real gems begin to emerge. That's right. It's sometimes <clears throat> we need to do it when we get stuck, when we're frustrated, when we're pulling out our hair, and we, we go to pray, we still can't get the right points, and we're struggling, we still haven't got it quite right. Um, I find what helps me a lot is just to go for a 10-minute walk, hmm. um, or take a, take, a, take a short break, come back at it, give, us, give your mind a little break. Hmm. Some Seminar audio for this. Having a merry heart in a mold. It's quite cat. Um, I think there's some merit in it. Yeah. Probably if, if we've got a problem today, well, I don't know if you can see that because everyone's so different, but there is certainly the Martha problem, isn't there? We, we could do with more sitting for some people. <laughs> we talked about this recently. <laughs> and then other people could do with more serving, depending on your particular weakness. So, um, John 3, 15 to 18. Some marvelous words. brought into this, we could easily uh, 7, 18, 18 in, the, 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 so let's just make it 316 and ask ourselves, do we have a good proposition, a good title, and a good outline? Well, I think the first thing to say is that we, we don't have parallelism, do we? Uh, we have the reason for the solution. The third point is closer, it's the heaven's objective, but that doesn't work, does it? Nobody speaks like that, the heaven's objective. And then 
the, the second point, again, it's just not in the same parallel structure. So more work needs to be done there. And if, if you just had these titles, again, the reason for the solution, heavenly action plan, heaven's objective, you, again, you just wouldn't know what text that was about. In terms of a title, the solution from heaven, I don't think that would send anyone to John 3.16. So a lot, a lot more work needs to be done here. Uh, again, if you just look at this and you think, you know, this is John 3.16, how do we manage to take that and reduce it to the reason for the solution, heavenly action plan, and heaven's objective. You know, when you get objective and reason um, involved in, a, in an outline on John 3.16, I think you're pretty certainly on the wrong lines. You know, <laughs> this is so personal. It's so passionate. Love. We need love in the outline. Love. Do we have? Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I always find when I do a class like this, I, I've got so many sermons to preach now. You know, you, you <laughs> think, oh, that's another one to, oh, that's another great one to preach. <laughs> Paul. When you put it in very limited text like this, yeah. how does that affect your points? Because say in one of these congregations, people are saying, let's have the, we want to have the decent time of the earth. But some congregations are not uh, full of people who are, you say John 3, 16, you immediately then all sigh out. Yeah. You've got a bigger barrier to get them interested. Right. So does that affect your point mm -hmm. so how? Yeah, I think you make a good point, Paul. My own experience from talking to ministers and congregations is this is one of the most unpreached texts, believe it or not. And I think one reason is because everyone thinks we all know it. And the other reason is because it's obviously got a controversial issue in it about the nature of God's love. And so for one reason or another, I've talked to many, many ministers, and I've often asked this and never preached it. I think a lot of ministers never preached it because when you actually start working with it, it overwhelms you. <laughs> yeah. It's such a big text. Yeah. And you want to be warm, you want to be personal, and you've got this whole question of love and the atonement. And right. It just, it, it, it spins out of control. I have preached it, and just like Dr. Beaky said there, it was really a bit of a disaster because I just ended up in a mess with who's the world and what is love, and like completely missed the point. Everyone's yawning by the time you get to the. I'd love to do it again. Mm. Yeah. Oh well, I that's encouragement. Really excited to preach it. But. How much time do you spend on the, the world question? Yeah, I think you can spend too long on it too. Okay. Yeah, I, I maybe spent ten minutes looking at different views and the things. One more.
So the provision in this judgment being cast out respect of Let me just give you a quick um, thing here. I preached in this. I actually took this as two texts. I took 31 as a text. Uh, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And um, use the illustration of eviction. So my points were uh, the property. In other words, the world was the property. Uh, the eviction. So obviously the devil has uh, gone and squatted, as it were, in the world, taken unlawful possession of it. Here we're told he's cast out, all that that means. And then thirdly, the repossession. And um, actually, this, no, I, what I said earlier was slightly wrong. In this sermon, I did add in verse 32 as the repossession. Um, how he repossesses by drawing. So there's a, there's a casting out and there's a drawing. And then I did, pre I did preach another sermon just on verse 32, and I used the illustration of a magnet, because you've got here a, a, this drawing power of Christ, and just used an unexpected magnet, an unusual magnet. In other words, it was repulsive, really, naturally, the cross. An unseen magnet, the way that the Spirit works invisibly in the heart and mind. An unrivaled magnet in the sense of how it can draw men from so far away to so near. And a universal magnet, all men, people from everywhere, every kind of condition. So you, you could preach a sermon with that as your second point here as well. I hope you can see that again there's there's just a lot of graphic material here that that can be developed tively. Okay. Good. Jun Ho, will you close the class, please? Amen.